welcome to Delta Live. I'm here today with Corey Doctorow. Corey is a well-known science fiction author, technology writer. Um, his writings are written across many, many magazines, websites, newspapers. Uh, but today we're kind of here for a different reason. It's October. Fun and spooky season. Uh, Halloween is upon us. So something very near and dear to Corey's heart is Disney's Haunted Mansion. So it is the ultimate dark ride. Welcome, Corey. Thank you very much. It's uh, I'm always happy to talk about the Haunted Mansion. Well, I am so glad you're here. So it is called the Ultimate Dark Ride. Um, what makes the Disney's Haunted Mansion so special? I think it's somewhat, well, I think it's the intersection of two things, right? One is the fact that it's got that kind of Disney attention to detail that, uh, you know, often goes beyond what any kind of um, raw commercial assessment could justify. They're just spending money because they believe in making it as cool as they can. And the other, I think, is in the history of the ride, which is that it's a, a series of uh, creators overriding each other's visions so that there are so many kind of fragmentary visions in the ride itself that it seems to hint at these sort of vast story worlds lurking beneath it that actually are are sort of there. You know, you can go back and read the treatments that different people wrote, Ken Anderson or Yale Gracie, Yale Gracie or what have you. But what you find is that it's actually like the way that your brain connects those dots and tries to make it into one story that is the source of all that detail. And so everyone has got their own mansion, really, when they go through it. Oh, wow. So... <laughs> What is the story behind Disney's Haunted Mansion? I'm sure it has one, right? Well, it's, a, it's as I say, it's a set of contradictions. So, um, you know, Walt was very down on the traditional midway. He didn't like things that were dirty. He didn't like things that were run down. That runs really counter to the idea of a spook house. Uh, and so from the start, everyone that he tapped to design the Haunted Mansion designed a thing that he then effectively rejected. And they, there was a long period when the ride was uh, a shell just sitting in the park with, with nothing inside of it as people argued about what would go inside. And they had this famous sign out front saying that, you know, it would be opening for business soon. And if you were a happy haunt looking for a place to rest your bones, this is where you could come. Um, but you had everything from the, the, the uh, Museum of the Weird Raleigh Cromps idea for a walkthrough that would just be filled with all of this surreal bizarre exhibits and gimmicks, some of which w would have been very difficult to pull off or, or to keep maintained. And then you have uh, the original Ken Anderson script, which describes a completely different ride altogether. And then finally, what, what actually made the mansion happen were the competing visions of Mark Davis, who's uh, probably the greatest character animator of Disney history. He's the guy behind all those characters in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride and, and also the great uh, animal gags on the Jungle Book cruise and then Claude Coates who was a spectacular atmosphere and set designer and if you if you go through the mansion you find that it's a kind of alternating series of atmospheric sets and really really intense character sequences and that they don't really strongly connect except maybe in a bit of the narration <laughs> so so let's you know walk us through how how does the mansion work how does it work, like, mechanically? Yeah. I mean, or yeah. how does the audience enter? Those kind of things. Yeah. Sure, yeah, sure. So, so again, the, the mansion is, is um, primarily technically impressive, at least in its original incarnation. It's been upgraded since. But, but in its original incarnation, it's technically impressive, mostly not because they invented high-tech uh, high cool tricks, but because they did stuff that was kind of old and time-worn really, really well. So when you walk into the mansion, you, you, uh, there's a beautiful queue area. It takes you through a set of uh, mausolea, um, which are there not just because it's cool to have a wall of mausoleum drawers, but also because it hides the berm that the train rolls around. And beyond the berm is the parking lot. Uh, and so they, they needed a way to kind of cut you, uh, control the sight lines. They did that with the mausoleum. There's lots of gags on these tombstones. The tombstones are a kind of credit reel for the ride. So uh, all of the characters, all the rather designers are, are celebrated in the names of the characters in the tombstone. It's a series of inside gags. So Master Gracie uh, laid to rest. No, mo no warning, please, at his request. Uh, dear departed brother Dave, he chased a bear into its cave. These kind of corny dad jokes on, on tombstones. 
milestones. Um, and it, it, it establishes right from the start this very fine line between spooky and funny, uh, which again, you know, uh, I grew up in Ontario near Niagara Falls, which is infamous for its uh, walk through dark houses where you are stalked and terrorized by teenagers wearing night scope goggles who leap out and grab you and frighten you and just are, are just incredibly torturous to you. That's definitely not what Disney wanted, right? They, they, they didn't want a stream of children screaming and crying emerging from the back end of the ride. And so th this is establishing that it's mostly funny. Once you've got through the queue, you come to the front door of the mansion and the front door uh, is this big double door. It swings open. And if, if it's being crewed correctly, there's a cast member, a, a, an employee and either a, an old butler's uniform or a maid's uniform in the signature color is the purple and green of the mansion and they say something like master gracie requests more bodies and you're brought into an antechamber and in the antechamber um there's uh, lots of nice little detail. There's things like an inlaid spider web in the floor, and there's uh, all this beautiful chintz stuff and flickering lights and so on. And there's this beautiful narration. And it's um, uh, the, the great baritone of Paul Fries saying, when hinges creak in doorless chambers and strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls, that is the time when ghosts are present, practicing their terror with ghoulish delight. And then one of the two sets of doors in front of you that are hidden within the wall paneling slides open. You're admitted to an octagonal room with portraits on the walls. Uh, the door slide uh, shut. You are exhorted to step into the dead center of the room. And then the floor starts to lower and the paintings start to stretch. And as the paintings stretch, what's revealed are these little sight gags. So the sweet old lady who's sitting holding a rose is actually sitting on a tombstone depicting her husband with an ax through his head. <laughs> and the implication is that she's, 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 she's topped him. So so the stretch gallery reveals itself. Um, at the end of it, there's a clap of thunder. There's great narration. You look up, there's a corpse hanging from the rafters, dangling from the rafters. And then uh, another door slides open. And again, if the ride's being run perfectly well, you are now in a, an, a, a long, empty corridor uh, lined with windows out of which you can see a storm raging. And there's this sense that you've gone from this very busy theme park through this set of um, one after another after another of uh, antechambers and elevators and so on into this new space, this space that is uh, empty, deserted. Um, and on the wall is a line of portraits. The portraits change. Uh, a young woman becomes an old woman. A woman lying on a divan becomes a kind of hybrid cat woman. Uh, a, a, a ship becomes a ghost ship and so on. And you round a corner as these two busts follow you around the corner and you, you step into a ride vehicle. The ride vehicle are called doom buggies. They're these clamshell shaped black vehicles that you load, you get on from a moving belt and you step in and then that takes you through the ride. And the ride is a series of dioramas that get spookier and spookier and funnier and funnier. There's loads of sight gags. There, there are a couple of very big set pieces. There's a, infamously this ballroom with just more stuff than you can take in in even four or five rides through. Uh, and, and it's full of things that look like holograms, the ghosts that appear and disappear and so on. And, and the most fascinating thing about all of this, right up to the climax where you ride past these mirrors where you can see yourself and sitting next to you on the bench in your ride, in your vehicle, is a ghost. Uh, the most amazing thing about all of this is that if you get backstage and you see how it's done, none of it is very technologically sophisticated. Like arguably the most impressive machine in there is just the elevator pulley. Um, everything else is stuff like Pepper's Ghost. So Pepper's Ghost is a Victorian haunt effect where the, the holograms that appear in the ballroom are just reflections of mannequins that are not in your sight line that have a light faded up and faded down on them. And there's a sheet of highly polished glass down the middle of the ballroom that they're reflected in. And because you're sat far enough back from it, you can't see the glass. And because you, your sight lines are controlled, you can't see the dummies. And so they appear to, they appear to uh, uh, spring into existence and fade out of existence. And if you've ever been to like an old uh, Carney Midway and seen like the gorilla turns into a girl, that's the same thing. They've got a guy in a gorilla suit over here. They've got a, a woman in a bikini over here here. They've got a sheet of half silver glass in front of you. They fade the light down on one. They fade the light up on the other. And, and what you think you're seeing is a woman turning into gorilla. And what you're actually seeing are two different reflections. Ah. Um, 
the machinery that runs underneath it it's like 12 volt dc motors with old fan belts it's uh it's you know four-way linkages it's the it, it, what it is is it is a superb technical execution of some very simple effects bound together with beautiful art right like the actual like at a you know the the draftsmanship of the illustration, the 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 hand of the painter, the sculptor's hand, all of that stuff is brilliant. The the music is amazing. Uh, Xavier Atencio uh, um, composed a song called "Grim Grinning Ghost." That's something of a an anthem now. Every bit is uh, as classic as "Yoho: A Pirate's Life" for me. And and you know, taken as a whole, it is. A remarkable thing. The other thing that's remarkable about it relative to say Pirates of the Caribbean, if you're familiar with that ride, is Pirates of the Caribbean is also a set of diorama and it's got a set of, of different um, you know stages that you go through to enter a, a, a more and more fantastic world. But Pirates of the Caribbean looks like a bunch of sort of towns in miniature or rooms in miniature and when you get off the boat and you walk around in them that's what they are. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Haunted Mansion it's all like all the good stuff is in a big uh, metal box in the old parking lot painted a, a shade of green Imagineers called go away green. And it is, it has a kind of eldritch geometry because the, each of the dioramas, each of the set pieces is sort of floating in space in this giant cube out there. And so while they seem to imply spatial relationships between one another, you know, you can see the attic at one point, then you're in the attic, then you're out of the attic. The actual spatial relations don't make any sense relative to how you're moving. And that gives it a kind of dreamlike geometry that makes it especially compelling. It makes it really feel like you're going somewhere else. And again, this is all just making virtue out of necessity. Like the reason both Pirates and the Haunted Mansion have a drop and a long, and a long uh, ride at the beginning is because they were built after the park was finished. There was no room for them. <laughs> and so they had to p build their show buildings out in the, in the parking lot. And so they had to have a way to get you underneath the railroad track and out into the parking lot to the big go away green box and then get you back again. And rather than, rather than um, sort of curse their bad luck, they made that an integral part of the story. It's that's that corridor that you go down that seems deserted right. and seems to have taken you to another world. It really is just a superb and, and beautiful piece of, of spatial storytelling immersive spatial storytelling just the way disney does things right i mean always with this um, uh, um, amazing perfection so as you think about the uh, the haunted mansion what are your personal uh favorite hidden Easter eggs or hidden treasures, if you will, um, that people should look for when they go through Disney's Haunted Mansion? So for me, I think it's all in the timings. You know, um, like just just appreciate the, the, the timing of the series of set steps that take you from the queue to the, uh, to the antechamber, to the elevator, to the empty corridor, and how you go from this very frenetic and so often very bright Southern California day into this dark room that's full of people who are talking and chattering and so on, and then into a much darker room, right? A room that has no door to the outside and has no light leakage, and where the narration really demands that people get quieter, right? And then the narration ends with this literal thunderclap. And when the door is open, you're in a, a, a nearly silent, deserted hallway. You've seen, right, as you've been in the queue, you've seen hundreds of people go into the Haunted Mansion. And if it were like a regular ride, if it were like Pirates, if it were like Small World, right, they would be right in front of you. And in fact, when the ride's not being well-timed, they are right in front of you. The door opens and you're just in a crowd. But when the timing is right, you go through this set of steps that atmospherically transfers you from the busy world of Southern California into an antebellum mansion that is genuinely spooky and abandoned in which it seems hundreds of people who you were just in the presence of have vanished in the blink of an eye, right? In the time it took you to go down the elevator. That I think is, is the, the most amazing piece of all. There's a lot of less subtle, fun things to see, like, you know, there are hidden Mickeys and the ballroom plates and, and so on. Um, but, you know, a pre, for me, it's about appreciating the, the other ways that they tell the story. So like the, um, when you go through the graveyard scene, the graveyard is, uh, 
it's a it's a great Mark Davis sequence, right? Because it's just full of characters. It's full of characters who have no business being there. There's like a Valkyrie and a mummy and a, you know, like, why are these people in an antebellum mansion graveyard? No one ever explains. But there they are. And um, they're all singing the song. They're singing Grim Grinning Ghosts, uh, Xavier Tensio's song. And uh, they have recorded their own loops with their own versions of this song. And they're all in the same key and all in the same time signature. And the way that the speakers are arranged, you just if you just pay close attention, when you get close to the mummy, you realize that while he's singing it in the same key and tempo, he's singing it with a kind of, uh, you know, like cod Arabic kind of Egyptian uh, uh, rhythm where it's like, don't close your eyes and don't try to hide. And it's a little different from the, from the, the, the way that the rest of the characters are singing it. When you go through the Valkyries, they've got German accents. And it's, it's, it's just these little tiny details that are there to reward the person who pays close attention. And, and this, the, the, just the wonder of the artistry of it all. Right, because we're all familiar with like you can have a good or you can have a Thursday, and it's not like they weren't laboring under commercial imperatives, right? One of the other things you see when you go around backstage is that there's a bunch of uh, elements that are stenciled WDW Walt Disney World, uh, and that's because the Haunted Mansion was the first ride built simultaneously in Disney World and Disneyland. Um, it, it predated the opening of Disney World by two years, but it was one of the original openers there, and they built them at the same time, and they just in the kind of higgledy piggledy and chaos just had to switch up which went where or maybe it got on the wrong barge like nobody really seems to know the answer (laughs) and 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 there they were right laboring under those constraints the same constraints as ever walt had just dropped dead right there's a a pretty widespread belief that one of the reasons the haunted mansion could ever get finished is walt was no longer around to say no 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 that's not what i was thinking of right if if it if it if he'd been around to continue meddling with it uh it they might still be arguing about whether or not it would be spooky on the inside uh and how spooky it should be and you know the first one or maybe the second one they built after walt died was the one in um paris where it's the facade that was drawn for the very first one the really spooky facade that walt explicitly rejected and they were like Walt's dead (laughs) you know (laughs) we get to do it this way now um it's a it's an amazing facade it's a uh, if you go and look up uh Disneyland Paris Haunted Mansion it's called Phantom Manor there uh and and just check out the photos online the the facade is a a really remarkable visual uh element right and it looms over the whole area that it's in 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 Paris uh, in a way that is comparable, I think, to the way that, say, like the mountains loom in Disneyland or the castles. Uh, and it makes it quite a centerpiece of the of the park. Well, let's step back for just a second. Are the are the mansions, the one in Disneyland and the one in Disney World, are the ha- haunted mansions different from one another or are they exactly the same? No, they're all different. Um, the, the, the Florida one is the closest to the California one, and they, they started very, very similar. They have a couple of differences because um, the water table in Florida is so high that they act- actually built Disney World two stories off the ground. So the, the, the bottom two floors are all just utility corridors uh, and, and service spaces. And so they didn't have to get under the berm. And so it's just it's got a different kind of setup and, and offload where you, you're, not, you're not, the elevator doesn't go down, the ceiling goes up because that's a lot cheaper and less failure prone and and so on um, and it's got a different facade. The facades all come from the, 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 of the two mansions both come from the same book. There are some scholars who've like figured out which books were in the Disney library, the internal Disney library, and went through them and found the reference books that they cribbed the facades from. Uh, and so it's much more of a kind of New Englandy building than, than the antebellum New Orleans building in, in California. Since then, they've diverged a lot. It's, it's different groups of Imagineers. They've got different constraints, different budgets. They trialed a bunch of high tech stuff where they they do they use um, computer vision systems now in the Florida one where as you get to the end rather than the go 
spouse sitting next to you, which is just accomplished by a sheet of half silvered glass and uh, like a mannequin that's on a on a belt that that keeps time with your with your vehicle and that they shine a light on and then dim and then shine a light on and dim and you know the mirror becomes transparent in the place where the light is brightest and in Florida they replace that with a big LCD and they use machine learning or computer vision to take your head off and have it fly around uh, you know like the the ghost can like blow your head up like a balloon and it goes so it's kind of cool and they wanted to see whether it would work you know a lot of the a lot of the rail politique of a Disney ride is in the fight between the operations group and the design group between ops and Imagineering as it ever is. Right. I mean, you have the people who want to make something cool and then you have the people who have to keep it running. And there's a, there's a uh, kind of inverse relationship between how cool and wild something is and how reliable it is. And so they're, 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 you know, they always want to try stuff in little bits and pieces before they before they roll it out to all of them. Tokyo uh, is almost identical to Florida. The way that Tokyo, all of the Tokyo rides were built, uh, is the Tokyo is actually owned by an independent holding company called the Oriental Land Company, and their deal is. Disney can't tell them what to build, but anything they want built has to be built by Disney. And their design philosophy has been, for the most part, to just go to Disney and say, give us this really successful ride, but build it to a much higher specification than you've ever built it before. Money's no object. And so just the, it's the Florida mansion, but with a lot more fit and finish. Uh, um, the Hong Kong mansion is super cool. It's a trackless vehicle. So you, you ride around in a vehicle that is an autonomous car and that drives around in different patterns depending on what's going on and it uses a lot of projection mapping that's where you use um, LIDAR to map out a room so you know what its geometry is and then you distort a projector image an LCD projector image so that it perfectly maps over the elements so you, you've probably seen you know maybe videos of the castle at disneyland on christmas where they they map over falling uh snowflakes right in this case the rooms just completely transform with light it is amazing uh in in um uh and then in paris it's phantom manor which is a wild west themed version of it uh the music isn't as good in Paris, and um, the original narration was uh, in English, which the French didn't like. But it wasn't just in English; it was narrated by Vincent Price, ah. and that narration is unbelievably great. And the current narration is okay, but not amazing. the The Tokyo narration is wild because there was a like a Japanese data entry clerk who was stuck in the trailer with the people who were trying to figure out what to do about the narration, and he kept hearing the loop over and over again as they were arguing about it. And he started making fun of it in Japanese. And they were like, that guy, that's the voice of the Tokyo Haunted Mansion. And he is the voice of the Tokyo Haunted Mansion. That's an interesting story. <laughs> so how many how many mansions are there then around the world? Totally. How There's, many different Disney? Uh, Tokyo, Paris, Hong Kong, uh, California, and Florida. Wow. Okay. So... <laughs> Those are all. Oh, the... and Shanghai. Sorry. I think oh, Shanghai. Okay. Shanghai too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there's Shanghai as well. Yeah. So personally, which which part is your favorite part of the? I mean, I guess you've visited them all, but what mm -hmm. what's your favorite uh, part of the haunted Disney, Disney Park? The Disney... Or which favorite haunted version? mansion? Yeah. Hmm. I gotta say, it's California. It's the that's the, well. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's Florida. I, I grew up in Toronto. My grandparents were Lauderdale Snowbirds, and I spent every Christmas and spring break at Disney World because they lived in a gate-guarded seniors community where it was a form of torture to be trapped there. And so we would get my grandfather's air-conditioned land yacht and drive to Orlando and stay in a motel and go to Disney World. And I would just ride the Haunted Mansion over and over again. So in some sense, some important senses, Florida is my home mansion. But California is where I live now. My, my wife works for the mouse. We've got an annual pass. When there's not a plague on, we go all the time. That's so great. And I, I would say that the California mansion is probably my favorite on that basis. And I would say that the thing that's most favorite about it is it's, uh, you know, if you've ever lived somewhere cold and snowy, you know that there comes a time when the snow arrives and you're like, this is magical and wonderful. And then comes a day when you are sick of it and you hate it. And then comes a day when spring arrives and you cannot believe that spring is here again. And there is a California version of this because every year around Halloween, they shut the mansion down and they turn it into a Nightmare Before Christmas mansion. And The Nightmare Before Christmas is a perfectly good movie. 
it is not my favorite movie. And The Nightmare Before Christmas Mansion is a perfectly good mansion, but it is not as good as any of the other mansions. It's nice for a change. And because we live close by and we go all the time, by the time January rolls around and they're ready to shut it down and replace it with the original mansion show, I am so sick of it. And I'm like, when do I get my mansion back? And there's a part of me that, that just like if you've ever lived through a winter, that thinks it's never going to, it's never going away, right? That, that this is, it's just going to be slush and snow forever, right? We're just going to have Jack Skellington and, and, uh, and, and, you know, the, the different song and the different dog and the different everything forever. And then they shut it down, and it's like the the Robin's coming back to San Juan Capistrano. Then the mansion reopens. And the cool side benefit of all of this is they have two one- to two-week periods every year where they give it a top-to-toe, right? Everything gets oiled. Everything gets taken apart. Everything gets cleaned. And it has never been in better shape than it is now that they're changing the shows every year. And so I think it's that, it's that sense of relief, right? Like I live in a place where we don't have weather except for fires. And, uh, you know, in Toronto, we got a lot of weather and most of it's terrible, but I'll tell you what, that first spring after the long dark winter is better than any spring day in Southern California. Cause it's all about contrast, right? If you think about Disney world prior to Disneyland, imagine if there were no rides and all you did are lines rather. And all you did was go from one ride to the next, to the next, you know, a ride for eight minutes is a thrill. A ride for eight hours is Guantanamo, right? Like it's, it's, it's like being stuck in a mechanical cocktail shaker and not being released. And it's the contrast, right? It's the long queue. It's the heat. It's the stickiness. It's the kids complaining, followed by the coolness and the dark and the the, you know, detail, and then you're spat back out again. And it's those contrasts that make it amazing, right? It's why ice cream is great for dessert, but ice cream three meals a day would lose its, lose its uh, uh, appeal pretty darn quickly. That's just so correct. I, I was sitting here thinking, um, I read your blog, I guess. I can't remember if it was just an article or a blog, but it's where you talk about how old were you the first time you saw Disney's Haunted oh, yeah. Mansion? 1977. I was six years old. Uh, my We had been down in Lauderdale visiting my grandparents. My parents had come along. When I got a little older, I went on my own, but, but they were with. We drove to Disney World, and it was back in the days of ticket books. And in the days of ticket books, you had to ration your tickets. So we had one e-ticket, which were the tickets for the very best of the rides left. And it was getting to be time to drive back to Orlando, to Lauderdale. And so we had time for one more ride. And uh, in those days, the guidebook was very thick because nobody knew what the rides were. So they had to have, it wasn't enough to say Peter Pan's magical adventure or whatever. You had to explain what it was because people weren't familiar with it. And so they're, they're my, my father is reading this kind of turgid ad copy that goes with each of the rides and we get to the Haunted Mansion and I'm like, that sounds great to me. And my mother was like, it's probably too scary. It'll give them nightmares. And, uh, and I just was like, as soon as I was told that it was too scary for me, I absolutely wanted to go on it. I begged and pleaded and wheedled. And it was a perfect ride through. It was uh, dark. The park was closing, and so it was empty. There was only one other small group with us. The cast member was perfect. She just chewed the scenery. I can remember her to this day. And then the best part was that this was the golden age of the uh, Haunted Mansion souvenir. It was back when there was a, there was a company called Randotti, which I always assumed was Italian, but it stands for Randy and Dotti. And they were the Southern California couple who made like cool plaster skulls and stuff. And so they sold all this, this great merchandise, tombstones that you could personalize with your name, magic tricks, fright masks. And I ransomed my allowance into the next century to just buy all of this amazing stuff. And we got in the rental car and I immediately fell asleep, which was my superpower when I was a kid. And I woke up the next morning on my grandmother's sofa in Lauderdale. And I you know, ran into the kitchen and said, she said, hello, Corey, how is Disney World? And I said, where is my stuff? <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't know is that our car had broken down in the night and that the rental agency had sent out a loaner and that when they carried me from the car into the loaner, they didn't take my Haunted Mansion souvenirs with me. And we never recovered them. 
and many of them have never been offered for sale since. I have bookmarks on eBay for recurring searches for these that go back to when eBay was called Auction Web before they changed the name. Wow. And they've never been listed for sale. And they are my rosebuds, yeah. <laughs> you know, my, my, my great lost loves. And uh, since then, the Haunted Mansion, uh, Disney, Disney merchandise has done a whole new line of hundreds of new SKUs, and some of them are just amazing. I worked on some of that stuff. I, I worked for Imagineering for a while as a contractor, uh, and some of it even won an award. We won the, the themed entertainment award for a thing called Ghost Post that was this kind of storytelling and merch uh, subscription box that we did 999 boxes of and sold out in an evening, you know, before, it was, before even the press release went out. Uh, and... Uh, um, and and it's great. I mean, we have probably more Haunted Mansion junk around the house than any sane family should, but none of it rises to the level of that lost merchandise in right. imagination from that long ago car ride. Oh, you know, when I read that, my heart just broke for your six-year-old self. Uh, it was yeah. like, oh, no, he lost it well, all. Oh. Clearly, I never got over it. I mean, here I am. I'm a 50-year-old grown-ass man complaining about it. So there you go. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my gosh. Oh, So why do we, Corey, love attractions like uh, Disney's Haunted Mansion? Well, I'll tell you Disney's answer, and I'll tell you my answer. Okay, there we go. Disney's answer is that it's a story. Right. And that, that, that's that's like you, you just hear so much about the wonderful power of storytelling at Disney, Disney uh, inside the company. And certainly the movies are great stories. But, you know, I'm a novelist. Right. That's like my gig. And uh, I write stories and stories are a weird hack because stories are a way to trick your reader's imagination into feeling empathy for imaginary people whose consequent whose actions have no consequences, right? Like the the plight of the the most, um, you know, the most uh, uh, tragic death in literature, right? Romeo and Juliet is is less tragic than the plight of the yogurt you digested at breakfast this morning, because Romeo and Juliet never lived, they never died, nothing that happens mattered to them. They're imaginary. The yogurt was alive and now it's dead. That actually matters, right? In some tiny infinitesimal way. So stories are a way for a writer to get you to have an aesthetic experience, an emotional experience, sadness, happiness, joy, excitement, whatever, through this really weird indirect medium of tricking you into feeling empathy for imaginary people as a very roundabout way to do it. And there are other media that do it much more directly, right? If you think about how music can make you sad or happy without telling you a story, that feels a lot closer to, you know, a direct transfer of an aesthetic experience from the mind of the artist to the mind of the audience. And I think that built environments are like that. You know, when you look at the Disney rides that explicitly tell a story, like the Little Mermaid ride, which is a ride that gets contemptuously called a, uh, a book report ride, they reproduce every major scene in the movie with, a, with a, a scene in the ride. And when you get through that ride, you could tell someone everything that happened in the movie. You could recount the whole story, but you will have felt none of the emotional beats that you feel when you watch that movie, which is a, it's a, it's a superb movie. Um, by contrast, if you go on the Snow White ride, which is one of the original 1955 rides, you could not in any way recount the story of Snow White when it was done. But you would have felt every one of those emotional beats through the transmission medium of a built environment, a really beautiful, really thoughtfully designed animated built environment. So Corey, in light of the emotions and storytelling part of the Haunted Mansion itself, is it immortal? Ah, you know, that is quite a question, whether the Haunted Mansion will be immortal. It has been called into question in the last year uh, as people have revisited the backstory of other Disney rides. Um, you've probably seen that Song of the South's uh, ride, Splash Mountain, is being turned into a Princess and the Frog ride. Song of the South is... Um, it's not a good movie, and it's not a movie with a good story. It's, it really is a Jim Crow movie that glorifies Jim Crow. And, it w and the fact that they built it in the 80s is baffling. Um, but, uh, you know, all of New Orleans Square 
is set in the time in which New Orleans was the most notorious slave market in the, in the Americas. And the mansion is a plantation mansion filled with white people's ghosts. And this is like a super thorny question that I've been wrestling with myself about how you take this kind of wonderful artifact that nevertheless have these inescapable racial overtones and rescue it. And, and you know, the Princess and the Frog idea was inspired uh, for Splash Mountain. I don't know what you do with, with the Haunted Mansion. I mean, do you make it a... Um, uh, Coco haunted mansion, you know, and make it a like a Day of the Dead haunted mansion. How does that fit in with New Orleans? It doesn't really, um, you know, uh, like you could go really dark and make it a Blackwater mercenaries hunting racialized people through post Katrina New Orleans mansion. If you wanted to really uh, bring home the the racial history that it embodies, but um, I don't know. And I actually think that that is going to be a challenge that we go through as a society, uh, is figuring out what we do to redeem the parts of things that have parts of them that are irredeemable, and how we separate the irredeemable from the glory, and without without having to choose between them. I mean, this is a thing that comes up every time some uh, wondrous monster of history dies. And you have the people who say, but the wonderful things they did outweigh the bad things. And you have the people who say, but the bad things they did can never be outweighed by the good things. And I think the whole conception that there is a, a, a ledger and that you are either in profit or in loss on your moral standing, and that if you are in profit, you can spend that profit by doing wicked things, and provided that your wicked things don't outweigh the good ones, you're still a good person, that that is a, just a foundationally flawed framework. And that finding a way in which these things can exist in superposition, right, that, that person that you loved who hurt you is a, is a person who did the wonderful things that made you love them, and a person who did the inexcusable things that hurt you, and that one neither erases the other, and they are both part of their story, that's a thing that we're still trying to figure out in, in all of our narratives about all of our beloved institutions. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, you giving us this uh, tour through this fascinating slice of Americana. Uh, Disney's Haunted Mansion, what an amazing uh, part of our American landscape and just such a fun thing to go see. Uh, is it open this Halloween? Oh, no. Oh, God, no. No, 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 no. no. So, of uh, course, open. of course, we just get to, uh, thank you for letting us go down memory lane with you. Yeah. Thank you for letting yeah, us go let's down hope memory lane. Next Halloween. Yes, yeah. yeah. We'll we'll miss it, but uh, just fascinating. Thank you so much. I appreciate All it. Right. Maybe next year a tour. Yeah, yeah. As they say at Passover, next year in Anaheim. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. See you.